Yes. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes. That Really? Yes. Bro, man. Dude. <laughs> Amen. Well, I knew something was going to go crazy right off the bat, and sure enough, it did. Amen. Well, I'm uh, like Pastor Tim said, we're we're getting ready to go off to camp in the morning. Woo! Yes, fifty-two teenagers in four vans and a trailer. Please pray for me. <laughs> Amen. One thing I want to do real quick. Uh, if you're going, if you're a, if you're a student, a Cornerstone Youth student, stand up real quick. Come on, don't be scared, guys. Stand up. Give it up for these students. Youth leaders also. Leaders, will y'all stand also? Come on, stand, guys. Let's give it up for these guys. You never realize. Now, hey, what I want to do real quick, gather, if there's somebody standing near you, real quick, let's pray for these guys, all of them. Let's put your hand on them. Uh, find a student real quick. Just put your hand on them, and let's pray. I believe God's going to do some powerful things this week. Uh, pa- some really awesome things happen when you get in these atmospheres at these camps. Students are called into ministry, uh, and it's not just that. I mean, you don't have to be called into ministry to be special. You can have a call of business on your life, but everything God calls you to do uh, he wants you to use it for his glory. But let's just pray right now and uh, that God will touch these students and uh, these leaders. Father, we come to you right now. Come on, church, pray with me. Lord, we just ask you to touch each student today. Father God, Lord, we pray that this week would be a powerful week of ministry for them. Uh, that, God, that their hearts would be opened, Father, to your voice. That, Father God, you would speak into their lives, Lord, that which you want them to hear this week. Father, let them be Uh, tuned in, Lord, to your voice. Father, they're going to have fun. They're going to be doing lots of fun things. But, Lord, I pray that, uh, Lord, when it becomes the time for them to settle down and to settle in, that, God, they would hear your voice. Father, they would feel your spirit. And, Lord, that you would begin to give them, uh, uh, do something new in their hearts this week, Father God, something fresh. Lord, we thank you, Lord. And we know, God, you're going to do awesome, mighty, powerful things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Give it up for these guys one more time. Amen. Man, you never realize how much you need your youth leaders till camp time runs around. And it's like, but uh, I've had so much help. Steve, Taylor, thank you for, for helping me with the van stuff and all that. It's just, I'm just really grateful because if you ever have been around me I have my area that I that I am in and I need help (laughs) I need people to and that's that's what I should do that's why God puts people around you that you can bring in because not everybody's strong in every area but uh anyway well let's get into the word this morning uh we're going to look at uh let's stand up, down, up, down, come on. Won't be but just a minute. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 37. And we're going to start in verse 31. Say amen if you're there. Okay. Let's look at this. How many of you remember the story of Joseph? Jacob and Joseph. Jacob was the dad. Joseph was the son. Starting in verse 31. You know, I forgot. (laughs) I knew I was going to do that. I forgot to tell them I was using the NLT version. Oh, well, y'all just look at that, but I'm reading now the NLT. Okay, let's do it. Verse 31. Then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's robe in its blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message. Look what we found. (laughs) Doesn't this robe belong to your son? Notice how they say your son, not our brother. Man, words tell it all, don't they? Their father recognized it immediately. 
Yes, he said, it's my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself up in burlap. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. You could be seated. I was looking at this, uh, this passage again this week. And man, when I began to read this, it dawned on me how, how much sometimes in situations it's not what it looks like. <laughs> it's not at all what it looks like. If you're familiar with the story, you already know that Joseph was Jacob's younger son, and, and Joseph was not really dead, okay? He wasn't really dead, okay? And you'll have to read, I don't, for the sake of time, I can't hit it all, but Joseph was the, uh, he was the baby brother. The mother brothers, they were half-brothers to Joseph, but Jacob, he had a lot of favor for the little baby, for baby brother. He even made him a special robe. Uh, a lot of scripture refers to it as a coat of many colors. But he made Joseph this robe. And Joseph would even, in scripture, it even says that Joseph would go and report back to Jacob when his brothers were doing bad stuff. Okay? You know, he would keep dad plugged in. Well, as you can see, these, boy, these other brothers, they were beginning to resent little Joseph. Okay, and uh, then he makes a mistake that was even more monumental in my view, but, I mean, it was all God's plan. How many of you realize everything's part of God's plan ultimately? But he goes to him, he says, hey, guys, I had this dream. And uh, my bundle of wheat rose up above y'all's, and y'all's bundle of wheat bowed down to mine. Hmm. And then they get mad, and they're like, you mean to tell us we're going to be bowing down to you? I don't think so. And then he has even another dream, and that one even caught his dad off guard. And his dad was like, what? But his, uh, he began to, uh, to think, well, what do these dreams mean? Well, long story short, we know the, the, the story, if you're familiar with it. He goes off to find his brothers. They see him coming. And in a nutshell, they throw him in a pit and sell him into slavery. Okay? But what was going on was, what about the robe? What about the blood? The whole situation was not what it actually looked like. Sometimes things are not really how they appear to be. Okay? Even though you can see it, and touch it, it's not really how it appears to be. That robe was Joseph's robe. That blood was blood from an animal. Jacob was like, surely Joseph is dead. But Joseph wasn't dead. It wasn't what it looked like. When I was getting this ready, I thought about, how many of you in here have ever been snipe hunting? <laughs> okay. Snipe hunting. Mm-hmm. This story immediately came to me. I'll never forget when I went snipe hunting. First of all, I was so disappointed because I thought I was, like, legitimately going hunting. It wasn't legit at all. My cousins, we were in Trinity, Texas, and they took me and two other uh, guys. We all three probably still need therapy over that night. They took us out in the woods. Man, they walked us forever. We had a flashlight, a brown paper bag, and we're going to get snipes. You know? Man, they walk us everywhere. In cir I guess by, right now I know that, I mean, I, I realize now that it was, they were taking us in circles, but then they take us off the, the trail or whatever, and they walk us out in the woods, and they say, okay, you guys... Stay right here by this tree. You stay over here by this tree. Shine the light in the bag, and we're going to go out there and chase the snipes to you. <laughs> and I, first of all, I was thinking, like, don't we get to use a gun or something? <laughs> but anyway, so 
I sat there, and I sat there, and I sat there, and I was the first one in my defense. I looked at the other two. I said, look, I don't know how long we've been out here in these woods, but I'm getting ready to go because we've been out here way too long. Well, my cousins were hiding up in trees, and right, I guess they saw that we were getting ready to jet, and they jumped out of the trees and were yelling like coyotes or something, and, man, we were gone. We took off. And, you know, when I was thinking, you know, the, the woods were real. We were in the woods. Flashlight was real. <laughs> the paper bag was real. In my mind, we were going hunting. <laughs> but we weren't really hunting at all. <laughs> it was not what it looked like. And... I believe there are people that are here today and you're facing situations in your life and from your perspective they look bad and they may really look bad they may really look how they are but it's not the end see it's not the end whatever you're facing you may have a kid a teenager probably <laughs> that's acting Cuckoo. Maybe you're, maybe you're married to a crazy husband that, that ain't fulfilling his role right now as the man of God in the home. He's coming in. It's not what it looks like. Whatever it is, maybe you're facing a, a health issue, a financial issue. Maybe you're, maybe you're here right now today and, and, and you're like, well, hey, man, my addiction is real. What I'm facing, what I'm in, it's it's real. But see, there's always a flip side. There's always a God factor. We just have to tap into that. See, the problem is we start looking with our natural eyes. We start looking in the physical, okay? There, how many of you believe there's a whole spiritual realm? I'm going to tell you what. There's a spiritual realm, and it's more real than I can see Ben right here. It's real, okay? If you could see the war that goes on for your soul sometime throughout the day, you would probably be amazed at what, what goes on. But see, God's always working. He, he's moving in another realm, but we have to tap in, and we have to realize that the way it looks is not how it's going to end. But you have to tap into that. you gotta, you got to claim your promise. Some of you have a promise, and you've given up on your promise. You gave up on your promise because things ain't what they quite look like. So you, you get down, you get discouraged. You got you to gotta stop looking in the natural and get off into the super natural and see what's really going on. Jesus, everybody say Jesus, can turn it around. But you got to believe that. You got to believe that he is who he is. You got to believe that everything he accomplished at the cross is already yours. Whether you want to grab that and tap into that and use that is up to you. You have it no matter what. It's like a tool in your garage. No matter it's like me, I got tools in my garage which I don't use a lot. Usually I go to Chris's house and bar tools. <laughs> but I mean, I can have a shovel in my garage. But until I go and grab that shovel and use it, we already have the victory. It's already there. Never forget that because of the cross, everybody say the cross, you already have the victory. You have already won the battle. Okay? Let's hang there just for a second, just to build our faith. So here's what the Word of God says. Colossians 2.15 says, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. Who's he? Jesus. He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Have you ever seen somebody disarm somebody? It's, humi it's humiliating for the person being disarmed because they're totally have been overpowered. You know, they're just like, you know, 
whatever. I mean, I haven't been disarmed lately, but, you know. Chris, why did you do that? It was freaking me out. He stood up. I thought he was going to disarm me. <laughs> but he disarmed spiritual rulers and authorities. Do you realize what that means? That means that because of the cross, those weapons are not, the enemy can't do nothing to you. Let me just break it down and put it in an everyday language. The enemy can't do anything to you but that which you allow, which will all happen right here, right here, in the mind, in the mind. Pastor Greg, you don't realize how much that sin just gets a hold of me. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Let me tell you how you overcome sin. I used to hate it when people would tell me this. I used to hate it because I would always use the word addiction as an excuse. But I'm fixing to give it to you. You know how you overcome that habit, that addiction? First of all, nothing will change you like pain. When you get sick of being sick, you'll stop doing it and you'll start saying no. But look, you don't do that in your strength. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We do it in his power. Romans 6.14 says, sin is no longer your master, meaning it no longer has dominion over you. It can no longer control you unless you let it. I was, I'm thinking right now, uh, we were doing a series on temptation with the, with the youth a while back. And you know the verse uh, that says, uh, come on, Grego, what would you say? Yeah, no temptation has overtaken you, that one. But God, and then it says, hold on, let me, let me grab it. Okay, I got it. Okay, it says, God will not put more on you than you can handle, but he'll make a way of escape. And you know what the Holy Spirit showed me in that verse? It had to be the Holy Spirit because I'm not that smart. The Holy Spirit, I read that and I was like, okay, God will not put more on you than you can handle. That's true, but you know who will? You will. I saw that. That may be simple to you, but to me, I, that was a revelation because that's what we do. God will never put more on you than you can handle, and he'll always give you a way out. But what you'll do is you'll put yourself in a position to where now you're in too deep and you can't get out. But God won't do that to you. You will. That's good preaching. Don't do it. Sin no longer has dominion over you. It's no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. We could never fulfill the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. But please, don't take grace for granted. Okay, that's what that next verse says. He has no power over you. So if you serve God and you obey God, you have all the power and the control and the authority over sin. Okay, Luke 10, 19, one more verse. This is good stuff. I like, I like preaching the word. Look, it says, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them, and nothing will injure you. That's powerful. Now, don't go out and find a snake and a scorpion. I didn't say that. It's just an example. Okay. What it's saying is, ain't no bad thing can get you. If you're obeying God, if you know God. If you obey his commands, if you're doing what he's asking you to do. So Satan has no real power over you except the power that you give him. That's the only power that he has. He has no way he can hurt us or destroy us, but he will try, what he'll try to do is make you destroy yourself. That's what he tries to do. How many of you in this room other than me are your own worst enemy? Oh, come on. I am my own worst enemy. Always have been. I think too much. I overanalyze stuff. I'm a control freak. If I don't watch it, I'm half OCD. 
my wife helps me with that. But it's, the enemy will get you to destroy, what did he do to Joseph? I mean to Jacob. He said, look, them brothers brought that coat. They said, look, here's his coat, here's the blood. And Jacob said, that's it, it's all over. Joseph's gone. No, he wasn't. He wasn't gone. He was still there. The situation had not changed. I thought about that uh, that movie, Batman versus Superman. Went and seen that movie with Randall, Batman versus Superman. And I was tripping out because how can Batman and Superman be fighting each other? Aren't they on the same team? <laughs> and I was really curious how this could work. But see, the enemy... This is just, I'm kind of rabbit trailing, uh-oh. But anyway, let me finish this thought real quick. <laughs> let me finish this thought. Check it out. We will either destroy ourselves or each other. This is just for free right here. This is always good. But after I saw that movie, I got to thinking, that's how it is in the church. That's how it is in the church. See, the enemy don't have any power to destroy you. It's the same thing. You know what the villain did in Batman versus Superman? He got Batman and Superman to turn on each other. He didn't have the power to destroy them, but they had the power to destroy each other. And it happens the same way in the church. We need to watch our tongues, watch out what we speak, lies, gossip, all that stuff. There's no place for it. We're on the same team. And I've been preaching that hard in youth right now. But we're a family. We got to stick together. Man, it seems like there was this whole thing that I was going to talk on and I missed it. It did. How can you be on page four and realize you skipped page three? What if you went back? Let me do I just, I've never done this. I was fixing to go to page six. But, but hey, you, do you remember David Blaine? And David Copperfield and that Chris Angel dude. How many of you remember those guys? Them guys were weird. They were weird, man. That David Blaine guy, I think he sold his soul to the devil or something, some of the stuff he does. But they were master illusionists. Master illusionists. That's what Satan is. He's a master of illusion. See, an illusionist majors in the art of optical illusion. And, and that's what Satan does. He tries to make something that's not look like it is. So you'll give up. So you'll quit on your dream. So you'll quit on God's promise. He'll get you to looking at that stuff. And the whole time, it's not even real. How many of you are like me and half the stuff you worry about never happens? I, it's, it's like fear's not real. Here's a cool acronym for fear. False evidence appearing real. That's what happened to Jacob in this scripture. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. Satan will begin to whisper in your ear and tell you all the bad things that are going to happen. Because what you see and what you can feel and touch to you is real. But that's not the way the story has to play out. That's not the way the story has to play out. And man, I about jumped all over my bedroom last night when this illustration popped in my mind. Do you want to know what the most, the, uh, the pinnacle of, of it's not what it looks like was? Jesus on the cross. <laughs> man, I saw that, Pastor Tim, and I was like, that's the pinnacle. Satan was like, I got you now. Uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, he was on a cross. Yeah, he was bleeding. Yeah, he was suffering. And the whole time, saving humanity. It sure wasn't what it looked like. That's good stuff. <laughs> Don't believe the lies. That song... Rachel, that you and the worship team were singing a while ago, and the, I know 
I no longer, I'm no longer a slave to, to sin, to fear. Yeah, that's because that's where I was going. <laughs> I'm no longer a slave to fear. You know, when you look at 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, sound mind. There it is. Fear is a spirit. It says it right there. Fear is a spirit. And that's one of the enemy's main tools is fear. There are people that are sitting in this room right now that God has been calling you to do a certain ministry here in Cornerstone Church. And because of fear, you're afraid to do it. Because you look at yourself and you say, I can't do that. I don't speak good. I don't talk good. I didn't make good grades in high school. I can't study that. Well, what do you think I am? <laughs> You can do, look, if God calls you to do it, no man can stop it. He'll equip you, and he'll, he'll give you what you need to do it. And then he'll put people around you that will encourage you. On that note, Pastor Tim, thank you for everything you've done for me. He'll make it happen, and nobody can stop it. Only you can stop it. Okay, well... Now I was on page three, and I'm going to hop on forward. But we had to hit the optical illusion thing, because that's what it is. It's like an illusion. It's not real. If Satan can cause you to believe his lies about the problem that you're facing today, he knows he's got you, because he knows that you'll destroy yourself. If you'll buy into the lies... He knows you will give up on your hopes and your dreams that things will change. You'll begin to give up on that son or daughter. There are some of y'all in here, and God told you they're going to come home. I know right now, I know last night, they come walking in at 2 in the morning, but it ain't what it looks like. They're going to come in. But, but, but because of what you see, you're like, it's all over. Some of you have been believing for your husband to come in. But because, of, because he come in cussing and throwing stuff, acting all crazy, dear Lord, you're like, really? Lord, I've been praying. I've been believing. Well, don't stop praying. Don't stop believing. Don't give up on the verge of something good. Don't quit. I told our youth Wednesday night, I said, the only way you lose in walking with the Lord is if you give up and quit. If you just keep showing up, keep trying, you'll get the victory. You'll get the victory. But we look at ourselves, and we look at all our faults, and we look at all the things in our lives that are, we look at ourselves and we're like, man, I get, you know, I'm all messed up. Well, let me give you a news flash real quick. Everybody's all messed up. Everybody is messed up. What is normal? I remember a few weeks ago, every time I preach this happens, I'm all over the place. I remember a few weeks ago, I was Remember the flooding going on? Do you know you sure do? You've been fighting with that lake down there. But we all do. But I pulled into my neighborhood, and there were cars parked all around the front of the neighborhood. When I went to pull in, I was like, oh, no, because the front of our neighborhood floods. So I went to pull in, and I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to keep going. So I, I, I went around, and the road was kind of open. And then I got up to the first road, and I looked, and I was like, oh, and there was a bunch of water. Now, there was a vehicle, and I looked at it, and the water was like midway on the tires of it. And I was like, dear Lord, I can drive through that. You know, I'm in a truck. Just so y'all know, I drive a Ford. <laughs> Don't be a hater. Don't be a hater. <laughs> but I looked, and I was like, that don't look too deep. And I thought, hmm, is this what it looks like? 
And I looked over to my right, and here come this young man on a four-wheeler. But this wasn't no stock four-wheeler. This thing had them big, I think it had a snorkel on it, if that tells you anything. This, this kid was ready for deep water and mud. Anyway, I, I stuck my head out of the truck. I went, hey! I waved my hand, and he came over there. I said, hey, I said, how deep is that? And he goes, it's pretty deep. And I said, well, it's just up to the halfway point of the tires on that truck. He goes, yeah, but a little further, it's deeper. I said, really, how deep is it? He goes, he said, it's probably right up to your, your running board, right where your door opens. Right? He said, it's probably right about there. I was like, man. I said, I just live like 20 feet away. If I could just get through there, I'm home. And he said, well, listen. He said, I'm going to drive through it, and it's going to make a wake. And then you just go, Phew. my brain's already going where I'm going to go. He said, I'm going to make a wake, and you just drive right on in behind me. And I was like, really? Will that work? Monty, I didn't know. I was like, <laughs> he said, yeah, it'll work. I said, are you sure? He said, he said, man, I'm sure. I done helped a couple other people. I was like, okay. I said, just when you start going, please don't stop. He's like, I ain't going to stop. I said, okay. And, man, he took off. And the minute he started going, I could see how the water level just woo. And I was like, oh, yeah, man, I was just right behind him. Went right through that stuff. See, that's how Jesus wants to do for us. That's how Jesus wants to do for us. I think about Peter when he got out of the boat. Man, Peter, I don't know what happened. You know, Peter walked on the water. He walked on the water. But at some point, he got to looking at the natural he, he started seeing the waves, Clyde. Started feeling the wind. And you know what? All of a sudden he goes, I can't walk on water. And bloop, there he went. We can literally, we can, we can spiritually, you can walk right over that situation with that husband. Right over it like you're walking on water. If you'll hang on to Jesus. Don't believe the lie. Don't get caught up in the illusion. See, that's exactly what happened today in the text that we read. Joseph's brothers had thrown him into a pit, sold him into slavery to get rid of him because they were jealous. Hey, you don't think jealousy will take you all the way to murder? It'll do it. Guard your heart. Hey, be who God wants you to be. Be who God wants you to be. Don't be comparing yourself to everybody. Joseph's brother had thrown him into a pit, sold him into slavery. But one problem still remained. What were they going to tell their dad? <laughs> what were they going to tell your dad? So notice, let's check it out one more time, and I'm going to be closing pretty quick. Emma, don't come yet. <laughs> but notice the tactics. They dye their brother's coat, or dip it rather. They dip his coat in the blood of an animal and take the coat back to their father, and remember what they said. Look what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? Their father recognized it immediately. And he said, yes. Notice the power of the optical illusion there. It gripped him. The enemy operates in fear. That's his only weapon, really, because he has no power and authority. We just looked at that. Clearly, the Word of God says that we have that, that power, that authority over the enemy. But it was false evidence appearing to be real. But if someone could have gotten to Jacob, if someone could have found him, they could have told him, hey man, your promise ain't dead. It ain't what it looks like. Somebody in here today, you need to grab hold of this because you're on the verge of giving up. Because of everything that you can see, everything, everything in the natural, in the carnal, looks hopeless. But the supernatural, the realm that you cannot see is more real. 
It's more powerful. But you have to believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that he can do what he says he can do. But you have to believe it. Jesus, a lot of times when he would go to heal people in the Bible, there were some right before he healed them, he would say, do you believe I'm able to do this? Because he knew their faith. He needed to build their faith up before they. See, just because he was Jesus, the Son of God, he had to partner with their faith. So he would build their faith. He would say, do you believe I'm able to do this? And they would be like, yeah. I, I, yeah, you can do this. I saw what you did back there, turned water into wine. You can do it. Our faith, our faith is what limits us in a lot of situations. Don't let the enemy make you jump to conclusions. Stand on that promise. Stand on the promise. Don't buy into the lies. Don't fall for the illusion. And I'm fixing to close here in just a second. Emma, don't come yet. Before, before service, she come up and she goes, Pastor Greg, uh, how, when do you want me to come up? I said, I'll say I'm fixing to close. But I say that like 15 times a sermon, so I put myself in a jam. But hey, I'm almost done for real. I, hey, check this out. <laughs> Y'all listen now. I feel like I'm talking to the youth. Hey, shh, shut up. No. <laughs> Dear God, how old are y'all? No. I thought about David and Goliath. I thought about David and Goliath. Remember in Scripture when David went to go take his brother's food? By the time he got, let me just read this to you how I wrote it. Sometime I just need to read it. It's okay. By the time he gets there, Goliath had already been shouting and cursing threats against the people of God for 40 days, right? And for 40 days, Saul and his men were paralyzed with fear at the huge Philistine giant, that ginormous man that was in front of them. They were paralyzed by that, and that's all they could see was the size of Goliath. That's all they could see. They could never get their focus off of his loud, intimidating threats, his loud, booming voice, the huge armor he had on, the, the size of that sword. That's all they seen was Goliath. They could never bring themselves to believe God's promise that he would deliver them from Goliath. The evidence, what they could see, and hear and touch gripped them with fear, and they stayed hid in their tents. And then a 17-year-old little boy. Oh, man, somebody needs to get excited. That is awesome. A 17-year-old little boy shows up on the scene. Along comes David. How did I write this? I put, but along comes a 17-year-old boy who's either too naive or too full of the Spirit of God to bow down to this problem, no matter how big it looked. And here's what's so cool to me about all of it. If you really dig into the story and look at Scripture, David never once called Goliath a giant. He never referred to him as a giant. But here's the real kicker. Saul and his army and David were both looking at the same problem. They were both looking at the same big, ginormous guy. But Saul decided that the giant was too big to kill, and David never even called him a giant. Never even referred to him as a giant. Let's bow our heads. Emma, now you can come. <laughs> Amen. When I was preparing this, I knew in my heart 